In the old days, the myths were the stories we used to explain ourselves. But how can we explain the way we hate ourselves? The things we've made ourselves into. The way we break ourselves into. The way we overcomplicate ourselves. But we are still mythical. We are still permanently trapped somewhere between the heroic and the pitiful. We are still godly. It's what makes us so monstrous. But it feels like we've forgotten that we are much more than the sum of these things that belong to us. The empty skies rise over the benches where the old men sit and they are desolate and friendless and the young men spit and inside they're delicate but outside they're reckless and I reckon these are our heroes. These are our legends. The face on the street you walk past without looking at or the face on the street that walks past you without looking back. Or the man in the supermarket trying to keep his kids out of his trolley. Or that woman by the post box struggling with her brolly. Every single person has a purpose in them burning. Look again. Allow yourself to see them. Millions of characters, each with their own epic narratives. Singing it's hard to be an angel until you've been a demon. See, the skies are so perfect, they look like a painting. But the air is so thick round here that we feel like we're fainting. Still, the myths in these cities have always said the same thing. About how all we really need is a place to belong. And how all we really want is to know what's right from what's wrong. And how we all need to struggle to find out for ourselves which side we are on. We all need to love and be loved and keep going. And all right, there's no monsters to kill. There's no dragon's teeth left for the sowing. But what there is is the flowing of rain down the gutters. What there is are these muttering nutters. What we have here is a brand new mythic palette. You know, the parable of the mate you had who could have been anything, but he turned out an addict. Or the parable of the prodigal father returned after years in the wilderness. Our morality is learned through our experiences gained in these cities in all of their rage and their tedium. And yes, our colours are muted and greyed, but our battles are staged all the same. We are still godly. Call us by our name. We are perfect because of our imperfections. We must stay hopeful, we must stay patient, because when they excavate the modern day, they'll find us, the brand new ancients. See, all that we have here is all that we've always had. We have jealousy, tenderness, curses and gifts. But the plight of a people who have forgotten their myths and imagine that somehow now is all that there is is a sorry plight. All isolation and worry. The life in your veins, it is godly. It's heroic. You were born for greatness. You can believe that. You can know it. You can take it from the tears of the poets. There has always been heroes. There has always been villains. And yes, the stakes may have changed, but really there's no difference. There's always been heartbreak and greed and ambition and bravery and love and trespass and contrition. We are the same beings that began and we are still living in all of our fury and foulness and friction. These are everyday odysseys. We have dreams. We make decisions. The stories are there if you listen. The stories are here. The stories are you and your fear and your hope is as old as the language of smoke as old as the language
these gods watching telly on their own feeling bored but not knowing what the more is to want it choose one look again and you will see the gods rise in the most human and unassuming of eyes now let's focus it's dusk on a weekday night the kids scream and fight in the road the cars slow at the lights the young men whistle at the girls get sworn at pan out slowly draw back here this street this road this house here kevin slowly moves about he puts his plate on the table he pours the stout slow from the bottle and he sits he's about to eat but first we see him eye the empty chair like where is she well she's not there kevin checks the clock and he shrugs his shoulders and he looks back down at his egg and soldiers the photo on the mantelpiece shows them both romantic beach excursion from the hazy past and Jane is beaming and Kevin clasps her hand in his, his smiling gently, my wife and I, he sighs, feels empty. So here we have them. This is Kevin and Jane. And Jane, well, she's bored now, ready for change. But Kevin, don't see it. Steady and plain, get on and get by type, don't mention your pain. Well, let's meet their neighbours. This is Mary and Brian. And she's sick of his lies and he's sick of her crying. In fact, if we're being honest, they're sick of the sight of each other and there's no point in trying. They haven't been happy in years. Now, Jane never knew she had a body like the forest in the rain, but she felt all that change when she heard Brian say her name. And now shame is ripping through her belly and her brain, leaving her in pieces with her secrets to contain. You know, lust, heavy in her hands, in her guts, the trust was once there, now it's gone all crushed. Her marriage was robust, to the point it was gathering dust, but now her blood gets hot at the thought of his touch, and it's no big deal, it's just a crush. Just one night, this can't be love, but night, 
takes weeks, months, it's good. She's such a fool, she hates the things she does. She tries to call a stop to it. She wakes up in a fever, sick for loving, she cannot sit still. She's getting changed, the panic thrill, the chill. She's lipstick in the cab, she's at the hotel bar, she's had a couple. Now she's smiling, touching. Tonight we are not wives or husbands. Tonight just us, just this, just crush me. Finish me tonight, man, love me. Poor Kevin. See him, dignified, resolute, head down. A monument to the cavalry of men who have never let down a friend. See him, eyes strained from staring too long at her empty chair while she gives herself away. And he knows it, he feels it all day, but he can't say. See him, majestic in smallness and quiet and no fuss. The boulder that won't budge. He crumbles inside but stays robust, supportive. Ah, oh, Kevin, your altar is covered in moss. The inscription's distorted. Embossed long ago it read once, stay true, even if others do not. Kevin breaks through the rock of his silent self-loathing. He climbs into his clothing and he heads out for work. And nobody told him to live life this way. But this is his calling. Not romantic, enthralling, not frantic, not falling. Head over heels, more clawing. One hand at a time up the precipice, fighting for breath. Kevin, a god who knows better than most how to settle for less. Bright sunlight through his windscreen. Brian is driving home. He just left Jane sleeping in that hotel bed. Well, now it's keys in the door and Mary's shoes are on the floor and their son's playing war games on the carpet and Brian is bored of his life. He stares at his wife. Now she's got a question on her lips and she don't want to ask it. She can't help it. Here it is. She says, where have you been? And her eyes are full of dread and jealousy. Brian kicks off his boots and he sits down heavily. Out, he says, and she stares. Out where? Just out, he says. Do we have to? And prayers are not spoken in silence so total. Don't push me, he tells her, and she knows she better leave him be. So she sighs inwardly and she gets up slowly. Here are three souls under one roof and they're all lonely. Because Brian shouts at Mary and Mary shouts at Clive. And little Clive just soaks it up with wide eyes. Jane's baby was born in the hospital that winter at dawn and he had a full head of hair and eyes that were warm and inquisitive the same colour as the skies in the middle of a storm with deliberate patience the baby grew going through the kind of everyday things that everyday babies do now Kevin was delighted, excited. He was like a changed man, overjoyed and entranced every time he held his boy in his arms and promised him, son, I'm gonna be the best dad anyone has ever been. Not thinking for a second that he wasn't. But gradually, suspicion started sinking in. You ain't got no dimple in your chin. But Kevin says nothing, he nods and he grins. And Jane stares at the back of his shoulders in bed. And he's facing the wall. And she's facing her fall from grace. And her heart's aching and breaking and small. And her mouth's full of this awful taste. Oh, but the thing is, working out right from wrong is never easy. When there's no justice and when there's no morals And if everything is weighed on the scales of profit It will be hard for this young man to grow up honest They name him Thomas And as he grows, so does his passion for comics His dad's like his superhero He always lets him win at Sonic His mum teaches drawing at Lewisham College And Tommy is a good kid He shows a lot of promise Now Mary stares out the window of the bus. She's thinking of her son, Clive, and how fast he's growing up. And it's hard because every day that goes past, he looks more and more like Brian. And if she's being honest with herself, she fucking hates Brian's guts. She looks around 
and all she can see are these young couples still in love and it makes her feel small. It makes her feel like a piece of dust on the edge of a tabletop threatened by every gust. She gets home now and the flat's in a state but she can't bear to mop the floor or put the bins out. She just wants to stare at the TV. She pours herself a vodka into a dirty teacup. She's put on weight, yeah, she's miserable, yeah, she knows that she should have a bath and clean up, but fuck it, instead she's getting pissed on her own and watching these chat shows. She puts a pizza in a microwave, she eats it off her knees. She's drinking and she's chain smoking till she starts to feel queasy. And then when little Clive gets home from school, that's where he finds her, fast asleep. Well, it's the holidays that hurt Jane the most. Watching Kevin play with Tommy in the garden and they're squirting each other with the hose because she can see it in her boy's eyes and she can hear it every single time her boy cries but she can't even begin to imagine how she would apologise. Jane, she's like this brand new Pandora. Her legs are crossed on the floor and now the lid's off the box. Heart full of shame and her stomach's in knots but there is no going back. She must learn to forgive herself and move on to accept that what happens in love happens beyond right or wrong. The time passes and these two little boys begin to grow up. Brian is drinking more than ever these days. He holds fast to the wall, is about to throw up. He's outside the pub, it's the morning, he's got his forehead against the railing. This little boy walks past, skipping the cracks in the paving, and he's holding his dad's hand, and Brian can hear them both laugh, so he looks up, but suddenly he feels like he's choking, he lets out a gasp, because that's him, that's Tommy. And Brian straightens up and he stares at the perfect little limbs and the curls in his hair, and his mind swims and his legs sway, and he lets out this deep moan. Well, a couple streets away, his other son, Clive, is kicking up the stones on his own. And Mary, our brand new Medea, well, she's sat at the checkout and she's beeping the items. See, in the heat of last night, she found the courage to leave Brian. But in today's cold morning light, she feels weaker and frightened. She's thinking, yeah, but how will I keep Clive from hanging out on those streets? The silence between them is already so stifling. She looks at her son and he feels like a stranger to her. She says, yes, I love him, but I can't tell whether I'd like him. She thinks, if I cannot reach you, then how can anybody reach you? And if I cannot save you, then how will anybody save you? She prints the receipt and turns to the next in the line. And here is a hero, knee deep in the desolate grind of raising a boy to a man on her own in these perilous times. And now Clive's 12, little rotter, mean to all the other kids, always causing bother, always giving someone grief. Starts off nicking dinner money, then he nicks a bike, then he nicks a kitchen knife, holds up the corner shop for sweets, he's a tough nut. Never got enough love, grew up in a house where his mum and dad barely said a word to each other, except when they was fighting, that's how he learned. If you got something to say, you better say it with violence. And Tommy's 10. Growing fast, going past all the usual landmarks. A quiet kid for the most part, ah, but when his hands start sketching, he looks like something's upset him. He starts wriggling around in his chair and his features start wriggling around on his face. Tommy never really had a lot of mates, but he could read a comic book and be happy for hours, just imagining the days when he would get his superpowers. He'd be in the back of the class, working out the stories he was going to write when he'd get home about all the criminals he was going to fight. And then when the bell goes for the end of the day, he's still in his own world, a couple dimensions away. Now Jane would watch her son from the school gates, and he'd be staring at the sky looking for Superman, ignored by all his schoolmates. Seems happy enough, she thinks, lost in his thoughts. But it shocks her because she can see Brian in the way that he walks.
And now Clive's kicking a ball against the wall, feeling bored and angry. Then this kid comes along, he's kind of tall and gangly. Nods at Clive, Clive stares back, says, what? Kid nods at his ball and says, let me have a shot. Go on, penalties. No, says Clive. Go on, my name's Tevi, says Tevi, tackling the ball off him and then passing it back. So they spent a couple hours like that till Terry's nan comes out and shouts at him, it's dinner time. Terry says to Clive, oh, I've got to go inside. But you could come to mine if you was hungry. Clive looks at him briefly like he's from another country. But then he picks up the ball and says, all right then, cool. And that was it. Terry was Clive's first ever real mate. And he cared about him, although he'd never tell it to his face. So one day they're round at Terry's and they're watching X-Men on the telly. And Terry looks at Clive and says, if you could be anything in the whole world when you grow up, what would you be? I don't want to be nothing, says Clive, and he stares at the TV. Me, says Terry, I want to be a fireman. Clive ignores him, but Terry keeps talking. I want to save people's lives and that, you know, rescuing ladies from burning buildings and carrying babies down ladders while the children cheer at the bottom. What do you think? Clive takes a lighter from his pocket. He starts fiddling with the flint. And he screws up some scraps of paper and he throws them in the bin, but Terry keeps on talking. He hasn't noticed anything. Do you reckon they really slide down that pole every time the bell goes? Because that would be wicked, though, wouldn't it? Well, Clive is setting light to the paper. He gets the bin burning. And when he sees the nice little blaze, he puts it underneath the curtain. Suddenly, Terry sees the flame, says, What the fuck, man? What are you doing? And Clive stands up, looks him in the eye and says to him, Go on, then. Put that out. And then he runs through the door and he slams it and he holds it shut behind him. And Terry stands there silent. He looks around panicking. He picks up a can of Coke. He throws that on the flames, but they just hiss and spare him. And he can't understand why any of this has happened. The fire looks massive to him. The curtains are roaring. He tries to throw his blanket on the flames, but he just ends up falling and getting caught on a curtain. And the fire's getting worse now and it's burning. There's something on his neck now and it's hurting and he's shouting, but nobody ain't heard him because nobody ain't coming. And that's when Terry starts to cry, but Suddenly he opens his eyes and he sees Clive. Clive's got a bucket of water in his hands and he throws that water at the wall and he tears those burning curtains down and he stamps those flames until they're small enough to smother. Only then do the two boys look at one another. My face, says Terry, it hurts. Clive leads him out the house with some reassuring words. He says, don't worry, mate, that could have gone a lot worse. He puts his arm around his shoulder and sits with him on the curb. And in the hospital ward now, Terry's taking off his bandages and Clive's at the foot of his bed, eating all his tangerines and flicking through his magazines. And Terry's nan's in the corridor, she's talking to the nurse. And Clive looks at Terry and says, does it still hurt? No, nah, says Terry, not really. Not much, but he's got this scar up his face like his jaws being clutched by a clawed hand. He says, I don't know what you're doing here anyway, because I don't want to be your mate no more. Oh, come on, Terry, says Clive. You know what I did it for, right? No, says Terry, and I don't want to know either. I was doing you a favour, mate. A favour? You set my fucking room on fire. Look, you'll never make it as a fireman if you're scared of a little blaze like that. You won't be no good to anybody stranded in a flat. I was only trying to help you, get you prepared. I didn't mean to hurt you. I didn't think you'd be so scared. I weren't scared, says Terry. For a minute, he just sits there and he stares. Then he says, yeah, all right. Maybe you was only trying to help. Maybe I would be a shit fireman and I'd only hurt myself. Underneath the hospital lights, the scar was lit up brighter than the rest of his face shining like it was still on fire. Stop looking at it, says Terry, and his voice sounds tighter than usual. It's cool, says Clive, it looks just like a spider.
And so as they grow older, Spider and Clive spend every day of their lives side by side. At 15, they got the same jacket, walk with the same stride. Spider gets in trouble, Clive is never far behind. 17, Spider sees a girl he likes, a really smart girl. She's gonna put the world to rights. She's gonna do her A-level, she's gonna go to uni. Spider says to Clive, how am I gonna get her talking to me, man? Every time I see her, I just feel completely stupid. You ain't stupid, says Clive, you just need to go and do it. Do it now, go and talk to her, ask her how she is. And Clive shoves him in the shoulder with an affectionate fist. And Spider nods his head happily, walks towards her casually. Hands in his pockets and then in his breast, grab voice he says all right what's your name and she says Gemma why and he feels the whole world change at the sound of her voice and he says Gemma do you want to use a fag with me or whatever and then she giggles because she's never seen a stranger or more desolate fella. Poor Gemma can hardly hold her shit together. She grips her best mate, Gloria, by the arm and they just crack up laughing. And poor Spider feels like a dick for even asking. And gripped by the sadness and the shame that's completely new to him, he walks back over to Clive. But for once, Clive doesn't stick the boot in him. Instead, Clive says, Spider, mate, people are muck. You either fuck them or they fuck you up. He says, it's you and me, pal. We don't need girls or anyone because you and me, we're better than everyone. And so they became the bad guys. Angry, disenfranchised, man-sized, punch-happy fists, sad eyes. But between them was decency. Between them was a bond, a shared weakness that made them both strong. Now, if we see them hoods up on the street, we'll walk quickly away, our skin prickling in terror. But they, despite cruelty to others, no love, though. They know laughter. They know each other as brother, friend, father, equals. Gods in their synagogue, an eye for an eye, their priests sharpening their steeples. They are like a two-man nation with their own rules and conventions and methods of keeping their laws. One man's face is the other's reflection. It's them against everyone when they go conquesting and all men are weaklings and all women are whores. And they will have their power. Two snarling mouths desperate to devour, to digest the flesh of a city that raised them so sour with a hunger for vengeance that never sleeps but endures a hunger satisfied every night but every morning restored now in the old days they might have been warriors swords singing the names of all the throats they had opened but in these times they are out on the high street smoking with nothing to fight for but fighting itself saying it's you and me spider fuck everyone else Tommy's 18 and he's walking around in a daydream trying to work out what it is he's supposed to be doing with his life. He's a passionate painter. He draws all through the night, but he keeps it to himself. He don't want to show nobody else, but he's writing stories, comic book style. He makes these drawings and his hero is always this young man whose life might seem boring on the surface because by day he works in a factory packaging dog food, but by night he's a superhero with a city full of bad guys to fight. See, these days, Tommy's old man doesn't seem to like him very much. And Tommy's parents, well, they hardly seem to touch. And Tommy can't bear the silence at home. So he kisses his mother on both cheeks and says, it's time I was grown. And he finds a little room in Peckham and he gets employment working for some jobs worth prick with a clipboard. Telly sales. It's OK. But he lives for picking up his pen like a farmer with a pitchfork. He gets to 22 and he's partied hard. You know, he's lived a little and his heart's been scarred. And at last he finishes his first full length piece of work and he sends it off to this publisher and all his hopes and all his hurts are just there in his story and he really hopes it's gonna work but the weeks go past and the postman jerks his head side to side. He says, nothing today, mate. And Tommy sighs deeply and goes back to bed again. 
tired eyes and a grey face. He can't work out where life starts and his pencil ends. She's got this faraway look in her eye. It's a look she's always had. It's the kind of look that makes strangers say, ain't so bad, love, is it? She's less flesh, she's more spirit. She's less chemistry, she's more physics. And her name is Gloria. And she works behind the bar pulling pints for the locals down at Albert and Victoria. And she's happy in her way. She don't expect too much from life. But she does believe that everybody deserves to be treated right. Now, she used to be a troubled type. That same look in her eye would invite the looks from the guys that she'd meet every night in the bars she used to go to with her best mate, Gemma. Her and Gemma, they were going to be best mates forever. They loved each other. They did everything together, man. They used to run riot, couple proper little terrors. But then Gemma stopped calling her quite so much because Gemma got into going protests and stuff. Gemma, well, she wanted the world to change. She was 16 and smarter than most girls her age. So while she was reading books and hanging out on picket lines, Gloria was sniffing lines and hooking up with different guys. And Gemma wanted to go uni. So she started studying hard. And that's when the two of them just kind of drifted apart. And then Glory ran away from home when she was nearly 17. He was supposed to be the man of her dreams. He had a smile like a jewel in a sewer, knuckles like an open toolbox, eyes like Kalua. He made her feel like he was the only one who ever knew her art, and when he told a lie, nothing ever seemed truer. Till one day she was in a state, in a heap on the floor, wiping the blood from her jaw, thinking, I'm sure I deserve more. Now at the time, she might have been convinced it was love, but these days, well, she hardly even thinks of him much. So she's the kind of girl whose scars run deep. But if she smiles at you for a second, it will last you all week. She don't compare herself to others. She believes everybody has their own strength. And if she was a statue, she'd be less marble, more cement. She's straightforward. She's no nonsense. She just wants people to be honest. She don't have no time for pretenders. And she's never broke a promise. Well, now it's Tuesday and it looks like rain. And the students are in and they're talking about change. Well, she gives them their change. And the jukebox is playing the same songs that it plays every day. No change. She's locking up, walking home. The light is distant and strange. She steps into this bar feeling old and unloved and she orders a whiskey and water off of somebody's daughter. And she sits in a corner feeling awkward. Now, Tommy's out walking. He does it most nights. He likes to get absorbed in the sprawl of the city. But tonight, Tommy shivers because tonight, Tommy feels like a Spartan in Troy. Oh, man, he feels like his heart is destroyed. But there's lights on in the bar across the street. So Tommy checks his pocket for his wallet and he pushes through the doors and he's standing at the bar and he's staring at the spirits. He's 25 now somewhere halfway between non-existent and infinite. And she sat there, thinking hard about nothing at all, staring at the ridges of the paintwork in the wall. And she sees him coming, all self-assured, self-hatred, and she thinks to herself, wow, that guy's got one of them faces that makes you want to take it in your palms and stare at it for ages. But she looks away quickly, she don't say nothing. But 
that's when he turns from the bar and notices her hands around her glass and is struck dumb by the grace of them and desperate to say something. Lonely, squashed, stressed out, dumbed down, raging, wasted Same as 
the editor looks out over his glasses and he's got a smile like dog shit hidden in grass. Complexion the colour of marshes. And he passes this fat, sticky little hand out for Tommy to grasp. And Tommy's mad nervous. All he's ever wanted to be is an artist, a wordsmith, a cartoonist. So even though he kind of hates the fact that this gross little man's got the power to do it, he's 26 now. He knows he better smile in all the right places. Because this might be his chance. And he ain't going to waste it. He takes himself out to celebrate. Allows himself the pleasure of a steak. A nice glass of wine. He's got a giggle rippling up and down the middle of his spine. You fucking did it, says his heart. Shut the fuck up, says his mind. Gets back to his flat now. He starts flicking through his sketches. Flicking through the telly channel, sipping on a beverage. Feeling like the luckiest man in the whole world. And counting down the hours till he can be with his girl. Can't wait to tell her his news. He's going to bring flowers. He's going to pick her up from work and hold her hand and together they'll walk home. She makes him feel like a superhero in a way that he's never known. All right, pan out. Soft focus. Reveal the subtext. See, beyond this couple striving on, there is more. There is the blood-specked sword in the sand and the bodies scattered around like sunbathers. They failed their auditions. They never had the spark to make the A-list. See, the gods are giving all they've got to give, but what they've got ain't up to par. They're desperate now. Please, they say, I just want to be a star. The gods are staring in their mirrors, hating everything they see. I just need to be beautiful, famous, signed to a major label with an airbrushed body that shines golden. And then I could be happy. But first, I need to get chosen. Choose us. The gods are on their knees before these false idols, saying all I ever dreamed of was to make it to the final. So polish the silverware, dust off the telly screen, because it's holy hour on Saturday evening, and the new Dionysus is in his dressing room, preening. The makeup girls hold their breath as they dream him into a perfect bronze and then leave him to his pre-show routine of... Aqua yoga and breathing. Quick shot of whiskey. He's brushing his teeth, he's pulling his trousers up to his nipples and is striding out onto stage. Here he is, the brand new permatan god of our age. And we kneel down before him and we beg him for pardon. And mothers feast on the raw flesh of their children. Struck by the madness that floods the whole country This provocation to savagery Let's all get famous I need to feel more than myself Give me my glory, my double page spread Let strangers weep when they hear that I'm dead Let people sleep in the street for a week For a glimpse of my head As I walk the red carpet into the den of the blessed Why celebrate this? Why not denigrate this? We don't know the names of our neighbours, but we do know the names of the rich and the famous and their ex-girlfriends, ex-boyfriends, ex-girlfriends, ex blah, blah, blah. Well, now, he is shaking his head. He is furious. He says, how dare this contestant have thought for a second that this godhead, this champion of unnatural selection should be subjected to another version of a bridge over fucking troubled water. And I stare at the scene. And I stare at the screen. And I can hear the troubadour singing the deeds of our Simon. How we took the eyes from our heads and then blamed us for blindness. And then I think, yeah... But why is this interesting? And furthermore, why am I watching? I do watch it though. See, in the old days, the gods walked among us. They fought with each other to save us. That's how much they loved us. Sometimes they disguised themselves as animals and they came down upon us and raped us. Well, they had badness in them. They had conflicted natures. But they felt what we feel. 
They were imperfect and faulted and if we excelled we would be by them exalted but now we've got these distant pinups, untouchable, shining and the fucking advertisements lying at us with their hands on their hearts so we gaze up at them smiling and I think I don't want a man of the people to talk I want the people to speak for themselves to love and be peaceful, if not peaceful, then incense to anger, raw barbarity. What I want is raw humanity. What I don't want is this vacuous cavity ripping the bowels out of our capacity for real, quiet, excellent acts, small heroics, everyday epics. It started picking up for Tommy a little at a time. He got a little bit of hype, a little bit of recognition. And suddenly everything was going to be different. He got out drinking with these full-time art guys who made money off their work. It was more than just a pastime, this was a career. It was all so clear he could do graphics for adverts and make enough cash to support him and Glory while he worked on the big story. So he got this job for this graphics PR team in the city, specialising in advertising. You know, young staff, pretty receptionist, a bar in the office, games consoles, fun team, dream job, big money, arseholes everywhere. But Tommy was excited and challenged. Plus he realised for the first time in his life that he really had a talent. And so he moved through this company fast, making waves, and he was celebrated. He had loads of new mates, and they all knew how to dress, and they all knew how to talk, and they ordered the best drinks, and they all seemed to walk into the room with the confidence of Bruce Wayne without looking like dicks. And they all knew his name, and they liked what he did. So he'd come home to glory, amped up, eyes blurred, and tell her all about his day, but forget to ask her about hers. And all she really wanted was for him to just sit down and see her. Instead of always ranting on about his new big idea He seemed far away these days Lost in this new world where success was just round the corner And people knew your name before they met you Now Gloria supported him as best she could But she was worried If they're quick to know you babe They'll be quick to forget you You're talented she said And I'm worried that they'll use you They'll chew you up, spit you out, confuse you till you can't get your pictures out without them feeling forced. Are you sure this is what you want, Tom? And he'd smile like, yeah, of course. And he'd take his new mates down to her pub and they'd wait there for the end of her shift and she'd smile without smiling. There was just something about them that she found so lacking. The way they talked as if the future was something theirs for the attacking. She knew her Tommy so well, he had the heart of an artist, but she couldn't make out the grain of their wood through all the layers of varnish. They seemed unreal to her, fake ease, and she noticed that not one of them had ever said please when ordering a drink, sure sign that somebody is full of themselves. It felt like they looked down on her and everybody else, but every time they spoke, Tommy grinned like a school kid in love. So Gloria, sighs to herself and gets some of managing her pub. And now it's Thursday. Cold, dark sky. The night sinks down to the curb. The curb holds the night tight and it's coming on 12. And the city is thick with bodies. It heaves and it swells. And Tommy's in this trendy bar uptown with a feature wall done up like a jungle scene complete with plastic leaves that hang down from the ceiling and everybody's young and clean and fake laughing and talking far too loud Tommy's got his head in his hands he just made a deadline a really big commission for a brand and everybody's back slapping shoveling coke Tommy can feel the damp drip in the back of his throat and he's thinking of that graphic novel that he's still yet to write and he's watching all these faces underneath the UV lights thinking I was meant to have done so much more with my life when did I get lost in this bullshit this fucking hype see here he is he's 27 
with a secret collection of comic book sketches that he can't bring himself to finish. And suddenly he sees how recently he's let himself exhibit the kind of traits he'd always told himself that he could never live with. Coming home, forgetting to be glad to kiss her, obsessing over boardroom banter, liquor from the canter, quick to throw a tantrum, stressed out, hitting his fist against the dresser, pent up, closed off, forgetting to caress her with the slow tenderness that he had shown her when he'd met her. Had become mechanical. He had to make this better. He could see it clearly suddenly beneath the pressure of the strobe against these bare shoulders and these flashy clothes, these glitchy pixelated smiles, sharp teeth and neat rows. I got lost along the way and I forgot what was at stake. Well, suddenly he understands and he hopes he's not too late. She's working the bar, the regulars are friendly talking to each other and laughing at the old jokes. These are the old blokes that are too often dismissed as no hopes. You got Sam with the squint and the dog called Daryl. Daryl was just four legs and a head sticking out of a fluffy little barrel. And Sam will have a Guinness, make it a half for the dog. The dog laps it from an ice cream tub at Sam's feet, whimpers a few times and then falls fast asleep. And there's Davy, and he lives on a diet of chips and gravy. He's in the pub at noon, he don't leave till 11. He's not really got anything else to do but sit there by the window making up tunes. And there's Geraldine, and she used to be a teacher, and she hangs out with Davy, and they get drunk all day reading last week's papers. These are good people by nature. They've just got worn out faces. Now Gloria serves them all happily, and she listens when they speak to her. A lot of them don't seem to have much else. Now she's a friendly face, and she knows them all well. That's why, even though they're skint and she will always refuse, they finish every order with, and one for yourself. The lads have got their arms around Tommy's shoulders. We're off to legs 11. You've done a good job today, mate. Let's call it a present. And then just like that, jacket slung over backs. They're all heading for the door in a pack, you know, off to the titty bar. Come on, Tom, we'll buy you a dance. They're all overblown gestures like mime artists in France. Business as usual down the Albert and Vic. Glory's helping Davy with the crossword. Twitch, the old punk who lives on the barge, is eating a Chinese at the bar, and Geraldine is serenading him with wishing on a star. These two guys roll in. It's around half past nine. And Gloria braces herself because they look out of their minds. Red eyes on fire from what looks like a big binge. Speed, maybe something much worse. Glory digs in her heels. And she summons the energy to offer them empathy. They stare back emptily. She says, what can I get you, lads? And her smile is wider than skies. But they're hideous. Pit bull necks and dried up saliva each side of their mouths. While she pours two ciders and slides them across the bar towards Spider and Clyde. And now they're in the back playing pool. And the old guys are murmuring, I swear that's Brian's boy. And she can hear the whack of the cues, the discs turning in the jukebox and their cruel laughter cutting through it all. There's a queue outside the strip bar, but Tommy's boss knows the doormen, so they usher them in, all big smiles, and my friends are your friends. And they're led to a booth by a girl with a tiny face and long legs. It feels weird, Tommy don't want this, it's wrong. But yes, Tom says one, this is our little well done. And he beckons to a girl and says, over here, Michelle, come. Well, she's ringing time. The regulars have all left. But Spider and Clive are in the toilet sniffing. It's weird, because she's dealt with big, ugly men all her life. But these big, ugly men feel different. They're asking for one more. She says, sorry lads, we're closing, but there is a place down the road that stays open till late. Spider's got his elbows on the bar. He's leaning in close to her face, saying, oh yeah, that sounds like a date. Come on, says Clive, don't be so uptight. We heard all about you, Gloria. You're just our type. Their faces are twisted. Their eyes are full of spite. They look vicious. We'll get one for you if you like. You got full pints left. Gloria points to their glasses. Just finish them up and I'm afraid that's your lot, lads. Why are you being so unfriendly? Asks Clive. You know us, we ain't so bad. She says, I don't know you and I ain't being unfriendly. Pub's empty now. No one else is there. I like you, 
Clive says, you got nice hair. That's when Spider starts giggling like a child at the fair. And he gets up and he walks to the door and he pulls the bolt across and he stands there and giggles some more. And now Gloria's scared, but she knows she better not show it. She knows that bullies like these two will just feed off her fright. So they just stand there silent, listening to the sounds of the night. And Clive is staring at her in the murky light. And a moment passes. She knows because she can taste its passage on her palate. And their eyes are burning. Their hands are twitching. They look savage. And she's seen this look before. She knows where this is going. She knows it. They want to do her some damage. Come on, says Clive. I can see you want to have some fun. Spider can't stop laughing. Thumbs in his belt loop. Stood there at the door like a minotaur playing at a sheriff. Gloria steadies herself. She knows where this is headed. Michelle is looming over him, staring down into his face like she's consoling him. But something otherworldly is taking hold of him. He's staring at her titties bounce, but all he can feel is the sickness and this loathing. Like he wants to run away, but he is stuck in slow motion. And all he can think of is glory oh, glory oh, the day that he met her, the warmth of her. And this girl in front of him, she moves like she's not there Hot breath on his face and her skin is so endless and hairless The room is so airless and he feels so small and so drained Like nothing was ever real or alive Like he's staring up from beneath water She's rubbing her thighs and staring at him with eyes that don't seem to be focused Face painted, she's pouting now, sexy by numbers But in his gut, Gloria calls him like a hunger and he can hear himself saying, thanks lads, great, yeah, really good to see you. Autopilot schmoozing, being charming, feeling see-through. But at last he's heading out fast and the air is cold against his face. And he's running to the station, moving like he's being chased. And he finds a tube and the world is small and he is drowning. And all he really wants to do is find his girl and have her throw all her limbs around him. And then the tube becomes a chariot of fire. And his heart is renewed with this honest desire. Shoes become wings as he flies towards her side to throw himself before her and promise to try with new vigor to be braver, to be bigger. He is baptized in the sweat of his fury. He runs and his breath beats the drums of the night into rhythms that sing, please forgive him. The whole city is seen through the prism of glory, all gold and all her. He is open and brand new and ancient and more himself than ever. He says, yes, I have strayed. Yes, my heart was betrayed by my pride and my ego, but by my love, I am saved. And at last, he turns onto the street and the pub is steady in the distance and he's twice the man he's ever been and his legs, they move like pistons. His body is on fire with a brand new conviction. I am off to find the girl I love. And say to her with honest words, I know I've not been good enough. She felt the atmosphere turning. She's known trouble all her life, so she can spot it from a mile off. In the way a smile drops from off a face. Clive's breath is so bad she can taste it. He stares at her, she stares at him, the stares awaited as they waited for a sign that the time had come and then it came. Clive pushed himself upon her, eyes full of agony and shame and she felt his hatred, she felt his hand around her throat, she felt deflated. Spider's breath was coming hard, he was watching from the door As Clive pushed her against the bar and threw the glasses on the floor Now he is swearing at her and at himself But she is staring straight into his face Intent on discovering some tiny trace of grace Some snatch of goodness But there is nothing, there is only cheeks puffing And now she can feel him rubbing on her she feels this scream gather in her stomach, then she hears that scream coming from her. 
And it's for every time she's found herself Numb before the pounding fists Of some disgusting monster She comes to life now She has found her wits For every lie she's been told Every time she's been beaten down Used and made weak She will call upon her weakness now For Tommy's silent stares Looking past her, looking through her For everyone who's ever fucked her over Clive is close to her now One hand on her shoulder The other is opening his flies But she can feel her fury rise She stares straight into his eyes Now he couldn't meet her gaze But she wouldn't look away That's when she reached behind her head And pulled a bottle from its place She swung that bottle in his face But he just grinned when it hit him Although he bled like something bit him So she swung again, the bottle smashed Well then she stuck that bottle in him Now he was almost laughing The blood bubbles at his temples But he keeps grasping His eyes are rolling His breath is rasping She grabs another bottle And she swings them both But now he's throttling her throat And he's pulled her to the floor And he's above her so close She feels smothered But she recovers her senses She kicks out with her knees She sticks both bottles in his guts And twists them till she feels him bleed Tommy gets to the pub And he finds the door locked So he's gone round the back and he's knocked, but it's open. So he went in whistling and that's when he saw, spider by the door, Clive on the floor, Gloria on all fours. And her eyes are all forced and she's letting out this roar and he sees a rage in her he's never seen before. But he is frozen to the spot, summoning them heroes he used to draw, but his supermen have all abandoned him. The shock of it has anchored him and he can't move a muscle and he feels like he's dreaming, he can hear his heart beating and the sound of her weeping but he's unable to move he's invisible, he's useless he's watching glory burn brighter than any one of Zeus's daughters, the fire in her eyes is inspiring he sees her the quiet resolution the timing the steadfast compassion that has kept her beside him he sees her as if for the first time And she is illuminated. She is shining. She got Clive off her and she stopped screaming. But Spider stood still, breathing hard. She feels like she is dreaming. She can see her face reflected in the broken shards. She can feel him thinking, she sensed he was about to charge. Clive was muttering and still, but Spider's eyes were dark and large and then he ran towards her but her anger is total and abrupt because she is sick of being shitted on and she doesn't give a fuck she strikes spider around her head she sticks a bottle in his nuts she twists and he screams he drags her to the floor knees her in the face but she springs up to stand above him and spit into his eyes from her blooded mouth she can feel The desperation of a lifetime coming out It was like she was assisted by a strength she had forgotten she possessed Her heart beat like wings in her chest She was silent now Staring at them both She's got her bottles by her Clive's twitching and spiders whimpering like a puppy in a fire. Tommy couldn't speak, but he walked gently from the wall and she turned to see him there just when she was about to fall. And she had nothing much to say, but they put their arms around each other. And as he held her, he tried to tell her with his arms everything that he'd discovered. In that journey on a tube And in that moment when he'd watched Her defending herself like a heroine A god 
And with his eyes, he tries to apologize for every night he hadn't kissed her right. And he knows that he is understood because he feels her hold him tight. are raising kids going uni doing part-time PhDs and masters the gods are having physio and learning how to walk again after a fall the gods are feeling miserable and they don't know who to call the gods are lying on the floor feeling far away and worthless as if the gods have forgotten that they're gods, that they're perfect. The gods are holding one another in the darkness of a pub. You see, the gods become the gods when they have got the guts to love. A god remains a god forever, no matter what he does. But still, a god should try and be the kind of god a god can trust. God should try and be the kind of god a god can trust. There are no Definitions of what's just Every god has got it in her To crush, to be crushed To fall, to rise up To give far too much To take beyond taking To hate To maintain greatness Is a state of mind You are ancient and brand new And basic Far beyond making ourselves Into nothing we need To recognize that we're something We can be the god Shadows and rain and a man going nowhere. Just watching the shapes in the dark. He's got a glass full of whiskey. Mind full of all the years that he ran through. He didn't know at the time how the days that he drank to would flood him and sink him when he came to be 60. But now here he was, alone in his flat in the dark with his whiskey. And all his young loves have grown up to be loved by much better men. And at the time he forgot them so easy, but now, well, there weren't no forgetting them. The dark clings to the trees in his garden like wet clothes. It makes him remember Mary, fully dressed in the sea. 
with her legs round his waist and her breasts in his face. But now here he was, alone with his specks and his excess flesh, his bad breath in a mess in a state. They'd had a son called Clive, but Clive hated his guts for being drunk all the time. And when he was raising him up, he'd thrown punches at Clive, left him grazed, left him cut. And then one night when he had stayed late in the pub, he had come home to find there weren't nobody there. Clive and his mother had packed up and left. He'd sat down in his chair and he'd heaved a deep breath. He said, I'm a man going nowhere. What could I expect? There was another kid too. They'd had this affair, our Jane. She was lovely, bright red hair. And it's not like he didn't want to care, but when she came to him all pregnant and scared and said, let's me and you leave town and start this family, he just couldn't want it. That was all years ago now. Still his misery deepened. And every night that went by, he seemed to get less sleep. And then after a time, he said, I can't bear it. Every day I'm getting closer to the care home, the chairlift. Days into weeks, into months, feeling miserable. Nothing to do on my own here. Pitiful. She is an old man now. No family to bring warmth to his pokey little flat. And it makes him sad to think of all the people who have loved him. Who he never had the heart to love back. Now, he worked 30 years at the airport, one of Her Majesty's henchmen. And now he was drawing his pension. And one day, he just packed up his things and he got on a plane and he flew far away from his disgrace and his pain. Now, Su Chin, well, she was lovely. And she was sexy and she was young and she was sweet. And she would smile at him when they would eat their lunch together on the beach and he could feel himself becoming something. Shaking off a life of being worse than nothing. And he knew that people thought a man like him as disgusting, but he didn't care. He'd found happiness there. And even an old man deserves some loving. Now he weren't blind and he weren't dumb. He knew it was his money that brought her kisses. He also knew that out there, poverty is vicious and his money to her family makes all the difference. And besides, back home he's living hand to mouth, but out here, well, his pension is riches. You know, he used to spend his time in pubs where he would pour his heart out to bored barmaids, compensating for his lack of friends by drinking till he passed out. But here, in paradise, in this fair Olympus where he's come to live, he's got a bunch of mates just like himself. He's got Ian, Graham, and Sid, and all of them are old English men with young Thai brides by their side. And they all go for drinks together, sometimes even motorcycle rides. And it makes him feel like a teenage heartthrob, like a catch, like a superman, with his big white belly hanging over his trunks and a bottle of brew in hand. Well, now it's Thursday. And he has sat out on his porch. And the sea is flat. And the air is warm. And for some reason, he is suddenly thinking back on his life and its miserable course. And he can feel the unfamiliar pangs of shame and of remorse. And he says, no, look, no dark old cloud is going to reach me here. I don't feel no anger. I don't feel no fear. He says, I am just an old man and I've got this nice young girl to hold hands with. But a single tear slid from his eye. His nose ran. He thought of Clive. Poor Clive. And poor Tom. He'd never even met his youngest son. And he felt terrible for the things he'd done. How we'd never been there to teach them right from wrong. And he wondered what kind of things went on for them. There'd be young men now tall and strong. 
And he hoped they weren't as foul as him And his heart was broke and his hair was thin As he felt the pain of all his sins And he thought of Mary, young and slim Dressed up nice on a date with him And he thought of how he'd made Jane sing in bed together And he ached, his flimsy morals seemed to shake and whimper For poor old Mary and poor sweet Jane and poor young Clive, so big and strange And poor quiet Kevin And poor little Tommy And Brian felt this sickness flood his belly And this lightness flood his body He drank deep from his whiskey And poor old me All the things that I hoped I'd be I never was But still here I stand I've done what I've done I've lived I'm a man And he raised his glass to the quiet skies And he downed his whiskey, smiling wide And he thought of Su Chin And her beautiful eyes And he chuckled to himself And he quietly died